Hello, it's David again. Today we're back talking STE. Uh, again, ignore the Falcon and keyboard. Uh, they're swapped around uh, for the moment and this one really does need to go back into the Falcon. Uh, but it's filthy and it's out here to protect it. But I'd like to do some work on the STE in the future. Uh, one of the problems though working on the STE is it's actually surprisingly unupgradable. What? This was a later model. This had sims, you could change the memory really easily. That's true, but the only thing you could change easily was the memory. Unfortunately, the age of miniaturization really kicked in, and we've seen a lot of things consolidated on the board. Uh, there's not a lot of separate individual chips anymore. There's now the blitter is integrated with the, uh, the glue, uh, the MMU has been integrated with the shifter, and one of the key things that makes this very difficult uh, to work with is that the, uh, the 68000 CPU is no longer a 64-pin uh, dual inline package that can be sold and socketed and uh, have cards uh, put into it, but it's one of these. This is a PLCC 64, I think, uh, socketed 68,000. So this is still a perfectly valid 68,000. It's still perfectly capable of running all of our ST software, but it's an absolute beggar to get an upgrade onto there. And the, the processor is the obvious place to, to attach an upgrade on the... Uh, uh, on the ST, on most of the 68,000 machines, because it has access to all of the address lines, it has access to all the data lines, and it has access to the bus control lines. So this is where you would normally apply an upgrade if you look at all of the terrible fireboards uh, for the Amiga and the, uh, the STF. They plug into the 68,000. Tosti Codavon plug into the 68,000. And the problem is that the, the old school 68,000, the, uh, the 68 uh, pin version, and I happen to have one here by way of example, nice great big profile, easy to solder, 2.54mm uh, tenth of an inch legs, just get a nice big socket, put that in the board and uh, get some pin headers and you're away, you can attach an upgrade quite simply, but this is a very difficult thing to do. Sure, I can pull the uh, the actual processor out with a pair of PLCC removers, but uh, how do I get my board to fit in that processor gap? Now I could solder, desolder the entire thing and we'd end up with a footprint like this. This is, I believe, the old footprint for um, the blitter chip prior to it, its, uh, its functionality being integrated in this combined glue and uh, Blitter uh, ASIC over here. Uh, and I'd end up with a footprint that looks, you know, broadly similar to that. And then I could sort of like build up a platform and then maybe an adapter and things like this. So it's quite awkward. Now on the Amiga 600, which is kind of a similar era to the, uh, the STE, they also had the PLCC 68000. However, that was sold directly to the board. That might seem worse but in some ways that's actually easier to deal with because what you do is you get yourself a, uh, a PLCC uh, 64 socket, you, uh, you shave off uh, the little uh, standoffs that are uh, within the socket itself, you invert it and you push it over the CPU in reverse. This is how the Vampire Accelerator starts out on the Amiga. Now okay, that is not particularly stable situation, you obviously have to use the bus control lines to shut down the, the, the processor because you've, you've got two processors on the go. Uh, but it's actually a relatively plug and play way of dealing with the upgrades. No luck when you've got a socket, you either, you're going to have to desolder something or you're going to have to invent some other way. Now in the uh, ST, plain ST series, you often found upgrades for the memory uh, would work on a similar basis where you had a, um, a PLCC socket there would work on a similar basis you'd have very tiny pins that would actually get shoved into the holes behind might as well just use a, um, an unplugged socket 
So here you have the pins that make contact with the uh, the PLCC chip, and they're basically U-shaped. So they go over the top. That's where the springiness happens at the top. And they go down the side, and the pin on the chip pushes into them and makes a spring contact. They then continue back down to the other side of the board, and they they will form the pins on the bottom. Sold onto here. Now, uh, what the uh, the old school method of upgrading these things would be is to try and shove, if you can see, try and shove a little pin down the back of that spring contact. So you've got the chip pushing from this side, and you've got another little sliver of pin shoved down the back. Now that's asking a lot of these little spring contacts, which, uh, you know, even on a good quality chip like this, are, uh, let's be fair, fragile. So I'm not a big fan of that approach. So what are the alternatives? Well, there's a company called uh, Winslow who make uh, kind of reverse PLCC sockets. I'll put in a, a link. So these, uh, these sockets basically convert the PLCC plug format to uh, a dip, um, not dip, sorry, but to a, a through hole uh, format that you can solder onto an adapter board. These are fantastically expensive. Um, a base, you know, the absolute base level uh, one, you, it's probably looking around £20. And they're, the problem is they're also tall. The uh, the amount that the, the uh, they stand off something like this, something in the order of 15 to 20 millimetres. Um, this chip is beneath the keyboard. So this chip is literally beneath the keyboard. When the keyboard comes back down, one of those Wimslow sockets is not going to afford us any space to work. There is practically no space here. That's the height of the keyboard at uh, the back point of the um, of the PLCC chip. And it's obviously a lot lower at the front point. This is the height down here. Effectively, these, this is the height of the keyboard here. So we're looking at, I would guess, about three to four millimeters clearance towards the front of the chip, and uh, maybe 10 millimeters clearance towards the back. So even if we bite the bullet and we invest in the, the Wimslow adapter, which are not always easy to come by, there's not enough clearance in here for that to work. So the, the obvious alternative is, well, can we make our own Wimslow equivalent? Now these pins are uh, half the pitch of the 68,000 dip that I showed you previously. Here's another dip up here. They're half the pitch of this. They are, I believe, 1.27 millimeters, or uh, one, uh, what's that, one twentieth of an inch, uh, uh, along, which requires some very, very fine pins, which are also very hard to come by. But by getting these very fine pins, arranging a PCB with the holes in just the right place, and this would have to be very precisely machined, we could perhaps, you know, we could poke the pins down in a place where the, the PLCC's J legs would normally be and pretend to be a PLCC chip. Now, the only issue with that, of course, is, well, these are spring loaded. So that would be applying a lot of inward force on the chip. Uh, sorry, on the on the pins. And after a while, you know, they're, they're just going to bend you're going to end up with bad contact. The way the Winslow uh, gets around this is by putting a, uh, a, a nylon or, or similar um, backing board around each corner, around each side I should say, uh, for the pins to sit on so that they can present a, a robust uh, surface for, these, uh, uh, for the, uh, the sockets pins to spring onto. So if we took all that into account, perhaps we could come up with an adapter that would allow us to plug perhaps the normal 68,000 form factor into this socket. 
So that's what Exos has been working on. This is a prototype board for the Exos uh, PLCC to DIP68 relocator. Now this was specifically intended to be used with the Terrible Fire uh, 536 ST edition and you can see that it's adopted this exact approach of very finely positioned tiny pitch pins mapping almost directly to the standard uh, 68,000 uh, dip footprint. This one also has the bonus of including some extra pull-up resistors on the data and address lines uh, for uh, improved stability, fingers crossed, and it's also got a Schmitz trigger here to try and clean up the clock edge a bit. That may turn out not to be required, this is still experimental. But I've been given one of these, which is very kind of Exos, and I wanted to have a go at building this up to see what we can do with it. What I would ultimately like to do is to take that 68,000 chip that I just showed you, fit it onto this board, try and figure out a way of getting this to plug into the STE, and to just, for starters, prove that this is a viable option. Now the hardest thing that I can see is going to be getting these pins soldered in and straight. Now what I've done here is I've used this uh, socket as a uh, uh, as a bit of a um, template. I've got some pins and I've just been trying to experiment with the best way of trying to line these up squarely in these holes. It's not easy. If I fit these pins, say, into this row here, which is itself not easy, how can I ensure that those are absolutely straight. Well, the tolerances we're speaking about here are sub-millimetric. If it leans a little bit this way, it'll be too tight. If it leans a little bit that way, it may not make contact at all. It's got to be absolutely dead straight. And it has to be at exactly the right distance from this set. If I pop them in over here. How do I ensure that that is also the case? So the obvious thing to do is, well, you know, why not pop this on and use that as a template? But of course this is sprung. And by popping this on, they're going to try to lean towards each other. So this is where the plug concept comes in. So I have over here a couple of slightly different sized 3D printed potential plugs try out. Now my 3D printer has not done a very good job on this, I'm going to be honest, uh, but this is only uh, prototypical and uh, I need to get my settings right. You see there's far too much curl going on here, but for the time being these should be uh, good enough to, uh, to experiment with. So I'm going to pop one of these in here. See that's a nice snug fit, not coming out in a hurry. And I suspect, unfortunately, what that means is that that is too snug a bit, because unlike the, um, the PLCC chip, the, the real one, where the pins are very flush indeed against the edge, and so make only a very gentle contact with the, the socket pins, these actually have a degree of uh, depth or thickness to them which we have to take into account. My printer is probably not accurate enough to be to within that level of, uh, of error, given how much it's, it's you know, curling and around the edges here. So I've just applied various different 1% uh, fudge factors to this and to see what we get. So here, for example, so here, for example, that would make a very snug fit on that side possibly too snug. Uh, 
I'm not sure I could get... If I got those pins in, which I suspect they would because there's a degree of spring in the, uh, in the socket, I'm not sure they'd come out without causing damage. So I think we can conclude that a, a snugly fitting plug is, uh, is not the way to go. So we'll go for the slightly smaller version. And this is again like a 1%. You can see this is far looser. There's actually literal wiggle room. And if we have a quick look at the gaps involved here, you can see, especially down this side here, look, there's a good degree of there's a good degree of separation there. And this is so loose if I turn it over it just falls out. But as I said, our pins, uh, in stark contrast to the actual uh, PLCC chips, have quite a de uh, degree of thickness to them. So that one sits in quite neatly on that side. And this one needs a little bit of, uh, of pressure. <laughs> in fact, it's popped that one out. So this could be getting close. This could be roughly what we need for the final version once everything is soldered in. That is providing a nice degree of spring. I can, I can see that here. But then we have the issue of can I possibly line it up now with the holes on this board. We're talking pin uh, headers that are one twentieth of an inch apart. Lining up one row is more is difficult enough. Lining up the second when it's flexing. Jove, I think he's got it. So I'm now, <laughs> I don't have my soldering iron ready. I wasn't expecting that to go in. So I'm now going to put this to one side as gently as I possibly can and hope that that stays put. I'm going to put my spool of kind of wire on that as a, as a weight. <laughs> I'm going to hope that that stays put whilst we prepare the soldering iron and let's have a go at tacking that down. So as I've said uh, a number of times previously I'm a big believer in the uh, the chisel tip for um, through hole work and this is technically through hole however the pin pitch is such that I I think I'm going to treat this basically as SMD work. So uh, I'm cool Let's get this changed out for my K-tip, which is uh, my preferred method of performing SMD work. And I'm going to have to get this cleaned up. So back with you in a bit. Right, we're back and my K-tip is nice and clean and it's up to temperature. Now let's very gingerly bring back into shot, trying not to get it all tangled up in kind art. My very delicately assembled first two rows on the uh, adapter board here. So here we go. So what I'm going to try and do is to tack down, might even go for the middle, not, not the edge, I'm going to go for the middle of this row and then switch and try and do the middle of that row and see how we go. I'm going to be coming in from, from this angle over here, 
so I will uh, endeavour not to get in the way of the camera. But it wouldn't be a uh, techno shared video if I didn't have a great big thumb in the way at some point. So, as ever, a nice big blob of gooey flux. We have our sold on standby just out of shot. Get myself a blob on the tip. And bob into a couple of these pins. There we go. Now, again, very gingerly, I'm going to spin this around, keeping the pressure on. Repeat the process for the centre of this row. Nice big blob on the old K tip, and in we go. Okay, now hopefully, with a little bit of anchorage there. We don't need to apply quite as much care holding it together anymore. So what I'm, which is lucky because I just tilt it like a seesaw. So what I'm going to do now is go along it with my uh, flux badly as it happens. There we go. I'm almost going to treat this as uh, SMT work. I am going to get a big old blob again for every few pins and I'm going to just drag down I think. is taking quite a lot of solder. Okay, so the acid test. Can I unplug these two rows from the socket on the bottom? <laughs> I have made... <laughs> I have made a Winslow adapter. Uh, right. Well, my concern was that that unplugged a little bit too easily. Uh, I'll tell you what I think I've done. I hadn't thought about this. Um, this obviously, <laughs> this is obviously 3D printed plastic, uh, and uh, the soldering iron, boys and girls, gets hot. Uh, so I think I've actually melted my pins into the PLCC plug. Now I'm wondering if that's an act of absolute genius. Let's see what we can do with the others. Well, my left-right alignment is not good enough. So unfortunately, no, I'm not sure that is an act of particular genius. Let's see if we can actually get the plug off. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can see that. Um, <laughs> the pins, ridges where the pins were on that side. Uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Just on that side too. And they look anything but straight, to be honest. I, I suspect... <laughs> I suspect I didn't really think that through. May have to have a bit of adjustment there with the hot air afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea when it's cold. Okay. So it could very well be that um, these uh, these second pair are uh, 
are going to do the same thing. So uh, let me pop. Let me try this again. Pop this one back in here. Maybe it was the other way up, I think, wasn't it? Pop these back in here. Provide a little bit of pressure. Hmm. Hmm. Not happy with the alignment on the bottom row, though. So my uh, PLCC plug is not the, uh, the greatest of designs. Let's uh, rotate that 120 degrees and see if it goes any better. So I want to get, I want to get myself nudged up on that side. That's that's interesting. I'm still seeing that gap on that side. So there's no lateral support being offered to that one. So perhaps my uh, my PLCC plug is not actually square. I mean, it, yeah, it's a really low quality, low budget 3D printer. So that really wouldn't be the world's greatest revelation. So let me turn that around 90 degrees. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming that's my 3D printer. If I turn that around 90 degrees and there's still a gap there, it's probably just too small. That's probably what that implies. It's probably just too small, and this one is leaning in too much. Yeah. I think that's what it is. This row that I... Uh, I just soldered here. Can we get that to focus? This row that I just soldered here, I think, is leaning in too much, being pushed in by the socket. Um, and so basically, yeah, the uh, my uh, PLCC plug, I think, is just basically too small. So there's probably a happy medium between this one and this one. If I try and fit this one in here, suspect it's not going to go because it's too wide might be able to apply a little bit of lateral pressure to the so pins just soldered maybe encourage it in no asking too much of it I think You see what I'm trying to do, because my theory is that this row is leaning in too much. This one looks relatively. Mm, actually, they're both leaning in. Yeah. So I think let's try Plan B for these uh, uh, these seconds too. And what I'll do is I'll just try and hold it as tight to square as possible and solder a pin that I'm not touching. Let's try that trick. So I'm touching half of it. So what I'm going to do is going to bob into this area up here, the uh, uh, the half away from my uh, particularly heat sensitive fingertip. Get that focus. There we go. And uh, we'll just uh, tack this. So I'm pressing as hard as I can to try and get that flat. I'll finish that roll off, and we'll hope that that's actually a. Uh, 
a better approach. Well, that was kind of the experiment today. Which one of those two techniques uh, was actually superior? Yes, not sure what we'll do about that. Maybe I'll just give it a try and see what kind of contact we get. I probably should have used my cheap and nasty PLCC socket. This is actually my good one. I've only got one of these left. I've got a couple of uh, really low quality ones uh, that uh, I abandoned uh, prior to this. And unfortunately, in one of my previous experiments, I uh, slightly damage this pin over here. I don't know if you can just see that, it's set back a little bit too far. I don't know which one it is, whether it could be extracted and repaired. I don't want to bend any more pins than I have to, to be honest. Um, anyway, never mind. Can't make an omelette without breaking eggs. So let's see how our pins uh, fit. Let's give our uh, loose plug a go first. It's not even the right way around, that's how loose it is. And pin, the pin one indicator is, is up on this side. The pin one indicator technically on this is over here. So this should go in this way, not that it makes any difference at all when we're just playing about. Now I presume, you know, when we did this on the real board, this would have to be kind of done by feel. It's difficult, you know, there's uh, no cutouts to help us align. Uh, we're lifting the plug on one side. When would you be brave enough to push on this, you think? I'm pushing quite hard and nothing's happening there. How's our alignment looking? Hmm, not too bad. Oh well, in for penny, in for pound, I suppose. Kind of, sorta. Not on this side. Hmm. Actually, it looks to me. Sorry, try hold this steady. Looks to me like we might have had a bit of a. Uh, Separation event over here. If we were to get light into that, but this side looks higher than this side, so I don't know whether that has anything to do with it. Naturally, it's just not terrible. I didn't clean that flux off. Ugh. So pin one, by the look of it, loops around here and comes up here to something like pin two. So if I come to pin two up here and just try a few around pin one region, see if we hear anything. There we go. Does it matter which direction I press it in? It does not. Okay, well what about over here? This little via. 
This must come to somewhere around here. There we go, none of its neighbours. Perfect. So this side appears to have reasonable contact. I mean, I really do need to go through these all, but I'm not going to do that on camera. Let's just try this side then. So these ones look like they come... Uh, this from over here looks like it comes down to here. So that one leads somewhere around this area. It's got contact. Okay, what about on this quarter? So that looks like it, something around here goes to that via. That looks like it comes from up there. So somewhere in this corner. Nothing. What's visible on the top? So this row of pins, oh, this runs primarily off around the side. So what's this one go up here to that via there? Let me lose it. This one up here around the top and to these set of pins over here. Okay, so we're looking around this this corner for something uh, in on this uh, section. Little tw uh, Twitter of my. There we go. Perhaps this has turned out to be good enough after all. Right, what about last section then? So these. These run off to up this, this direction here. So somewhere from the middle here. going to be one in this kind of area up here. Oh, look, Twitter. I'm seeing a capacitance pop up every now and again on this pin. Maybe that's a power pin or something. Let's try a different pin at the top. No, I think we're going to have to be a bit more targeted here. So... One of these pins, very, very difficult to see on these tra little traces under here, especially in this light. So one of these pins, all the way along here, around this region, come up to these little vias under here. So let's see what we can find by probing those vias. So I'm going to go for that one there, and the pins were somewhere around this region. There we go. Okay, so good. So all four sides have at least one pin that uh, buses out. I'm not going to pretend that is the greatest either bit of soldering ever or the uh, greatest PLCC plug ever. Now, yeah, very much not. But I do wonder if that's worth a try. 
or is it worth a little try? Doesn't seem to have damaged my pins any more than I had already done. Is it worth a cheeky first time? No proper testing try. Despite it being all covered in filth and muck and my SCE being pristine and lovely. Mm. You know what I'm going to say. Okay, so pin to pin, strip in the breadboard. Our uh, header socket on top of that. Board goes on top. You know, kind of slightly futile attempt to keep it straight. And I'm just going to whiz along here. So it's the first time I've had this uh, 16 megahertz uh, 68030, oh, sorry, 68000 uh, out of its uh, um, protective, to be honest. And uh, it did have one uh, pin that I had to correct there. But uh, it's, uh, look at that, it's still got the, uh, the bow that you associate with, with a new chip. Um, so I haven't try and straighten it up a bit using the rotate against the bench technique in order to be able to get it into uh, my pin headers. That's not bad. Still a bit splayed on this side. To get it into the, uh, the pin headers here so that I can be sure that uh, uh, I'm soldering them in straight. I had assumed uh, that when I bought it off Exos that it was a, uh, a reclaimed one, but no, it's uh, it's brand spanky. Okay, I'm not going to push that in because I'm going to have to take it out again, but I think that now is close enough that I can be content that that can be made to fit. There we go, we're soldered up, and now it just needs a monumental clean-up. Okay, so we've had a short clean-up, so let's try and get our processor in here and see whether we can actually mount this in the STE. Ah, absolutely top priority, first things first, better make sure that there's no shorts to ground. Uh, by that I mean that 5 volts and ground are not uh, uh, not shorted. Okay, so pin 14 is VCC and pin 16 is ground. So uh, that's pin 1. So 1, 2, ah, <laughs> it'll be the one that the... Uh, uh, it'll be the one here that the... Um, Capacitors across, I suspect, but well, let's just double check that. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's pin 12. No, that's BG AC. I can't for the moment, so that's pin. I'll okay, count from the wrong side, that's pin 1 there. I've had it upside down. Yep, okay, so pin 49 and pin 53 are ground. So, uh, it is a 64 pin, no, I've been calling it 68. It's a, it's a dip 60, uh, 64. So 64, 63, 62, 61, 6, uh, 60, 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, that is ground. Uh, 52, 51, 50, 49 is VCC. So 
We should we should have a capacitive load here, no short. Sure enough, it charges. No short. Uh, so the reason we don't have an open loop now after charging up is presumably because of that uh, Schmidt trigger there, which is um, across the power rail, obviously drawing power. Uh, so that's fair enough. Uh, so good, no short to ground. Um, so no, nothing from pin one to pin. 16 should be to ground. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And uh, lost my count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. That should be ground. There we go. So none of these should be short. So I think we're good to load up our or try to load up our CPU and give this a try. So what I'm going to try and do is to put the put one side in here and see how close we get on this side. Maybe just do a few pins at a time with my thumb. Just push them over the lip gently. Now I think we need to roll it a little bit more. I think this side might be okay now. That's close. So I'm going to apply some pressure. Oh, that's very close. Apply some pressure this way because the back pins are in. There we go. All the pins look in. Pin one is at the correct end. So we'll squeeze that down. That is now seated. If these pins do their job, if my soldering is all up to spec, this could work. Okay, so here we are back to the SCU. I've moved the keyboard a little bit further away and I've just covered up my power supply a bit there. I'm not plugged into the mains at the moment uh, because this is going to be quite tricky and I don't want to accidentally slip and basically kill myself. So, first things first, we need to get out our. No, I'll tell you what. First, Let's prove that we've got a working board. So I'm going to plug in the power. It's all connected. Right, we've got a green light. And with any luck, we should get something on our screen. I can hear the floppy seeking. So we have a working machine as things stand. Not after I've got it at it. Right, so power off at the wall. Okay, I found my PLCC puller. I'm going to try to gently remove the 68,000. Who knows if this has ever come out, so this may be quite stiff. Clunk. All in one go, yes, that was very stiff. So there is our PLCC 68000, and you can see uh, how low profile the pins are around the edge compared to the chip. Obviously, they just come, they tuck in underneath, underneath the chip there. So be careful not to lose that. 
because when this doesn't work, and let's be honest, the chances of this actually working uh, without me having sat here and buzzed all the lines out uh, and adjusted this clearly very sloping line of pins over here. Uh, without me uh, having done all of that, you know, this is a long shot. I'll give myself perhaps one chance in ten. So pin one is indicated on the board, a bit in the bottom here. Uh, that's indicated by the arrow here. And this should just about fit in here. The idea is that the TF365 uh, goes along. This just, just should fit in here without the floppy being fouled. Now this is going to be very difficult. But I'm just going to check the alignment. It is incredibly tight on that floppy. Maybe I should remove that just for safety's sake. Yeah, I'm sorry, boring as it is, I'm going to remove the floppy just for safety's sake whilst I do this alignment test. Okay, so I've got my plug in place. I'm going to see if I can figure out the alignment here. That feels pretty close. How much force can I apply? That feels like a lot of force, to be honest. That said, I think it's going in a bit. Oh, cool. Okay, that really is not properly in. But I'm going to see if that has enough connection. Here we go then. Gonna gonna throw the switch. Green light, no smoke, white screen, Atari logo. Ha ha. Ah oh, well that is amazing. <laughs> but I am very pleased with that. This opens up a lot of possibilities now. I'm delighted. Dare I to take my uh, my thumb off my finger off this? Uh, let's give it a go. Keep the mouse moving. Okay, look, that's not perfect. That's not all the way in. I need to work on my plug. I know my pins are poorly aligned. But there we go. We've got an external CPU running on the STE. Ah, oh, sorry, I just realised that you couldn't see the Atari logo. It did work, I promise you. There's the screen. Wow, that's fantastic. And it is obviously very much not straight at the moment. Uh, that needs that needs improvement. And I'm not entirely convinced that actually the keyboard will go back on or the disk drive will fit. I'm just looking at the, uh, the clearance back here. I'm not sure the disk drive is going to go back in. And looking at the uh, the angle of this, I'm not sure that the uh, keyboard will sit in either. So I suspect a little bit more thought needed. Perhaps uh, the socket is basically a uh, a no no. Um, but that's brilliant. We've got a, a uh, um, 60 megahertz capable. It's not running at 60 megahertz. It's running at uh, it's running at eight. But possibility to do something with that. There's a 60 megahertz capable uh, DIP64 CPU driving my SCE through a homemade Winslow style PLCC plug. And it's thanks very much to Exos for sending me his development board here to give that a try with. So if we disregard the keyboard for a moment, uh, how does the floppy uh, look? It's obviously a GoTech, but same form factor. Try and return this to its standoff. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. That is literally hard up. Oops. That broken off. That's literally hard up against the GoTech there. Um, but I think actually that does fit. That must have been <laughs> that must have been measured by Exos to uh, to the millimeter. So, so I think any work we do on this is going to have to be with the lid off. 
but I'm so I'm so pleased with that. Now this might not, as I say, be the way that you do it. You might in fact need to run some fly cables or something, or have it very, very low profile, have whatever you, you're fitting here um, actually um, connected to and uh, soldered directly onto the board. But this is proof of concept. And if we can get it to run with an external 68,000, in theory, we have access to all of those expansions. It would now just be a case of packaging. Great. Well, thank you very much for watching that. I will probably need to go away and investigate how to improve that alignment. Yeah, look, you can see there. That's why it was sitting at an angle. The pins are actually riding halfway up my plug. But now that I've got... I wonder if that would actually work now. Let me put those in. Where well, that would sit flatter. I was about to say goodbye. But you know what? That is worth trying. So, my 3D printed PLCC plug is now sitting flush. Let me try and introduce it to the socket without banging the floppy out of the way. There we go, that feels like it's about right. Nice and gently to start with. There we go. Ah, oh, that. I'm not sure I can get you low enough there to see that. That is so much flusher. No, it's definitely riding up. Yeah, no. Sadly, it's not still quite enough. Uh, for the keyboard to fit in terms of its height but I think the floppy disk is is too within a, f a fraction of a millimetre let's see if we can uh, power that on again if uh, if that's a, a better connection green light, white screen Atari logo So two thumbs up from me. Actually a quick postscript because someone's bound to ask. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, putting the uh, uh, PLCC 68000 back in does work. Uh, the, the adapter has uh, has not damaged the pins.